This is the fist model of the brain. So hopefully wherever you are, you can just hold up your little hand. This was developed by Dan Siegel. And you're gonna fold over your thumb and then close your hand. And this is your brain. And so right here you have your brain stem that goes up the back of your neck, right? Your, your fingers here, if you waggle your fingers around, that is your prefrontal cortex. That's this big human, um, powerful upstairs brain. That when we, when we think of like, oh, use your brain, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. We want people to be using this part of their brain. Okay. You open your hand right down here, right by your brain stem, deep, deep, deep in your brain is the downstairs brain. It is the home of big primal feelings. It is um, survival. It is your, your defense mechanisms, right? Um, this, your little thumbnail here in the middle, that's your amygdala. So it's gotten a lot of good press, right? We, we know some, some of us have heard of the amygdala, which is great. Your amygdala is the gatekeeper. Your amygdala decides, does this signal, does the buzzing coming from my computer or my kid yelling in the other room, is that a, is that a panic response? Do I need to move fast and furious from my downstairs brain? Or can I go slow and curious with my upstairs brain? Can I let it play out? Can I let the drama play out a little bit and see if they need help? Or, or is this an emergency and I need to bolt from my seat right this second, right? So that's how our brain works. When I'm talking about developmental trauma, early life trauma, um, changing the, the foundational architecture of our brains, we're not, we're not born with this well-connected brain. Um, a baby can't do that. I mean, a, a slow and curious way of understanding the world. A newborn baby, well, you tell me, Melissa, when, an, when a newborn baby is hungry, what do they do? Immediate cry. Immediate cry. Yeah. And when do they stop crying? As soon as that need is met. As soon as the need is met and not a second sooner, right? Especially in those, in those first couple of months. And so what's happening from a brain perspective during that time is a uh, baby has a need, need hits the amygdala, goes immediately to the downstairs brain, safe big critter, so their, their mom often, right, or adult or grandma or foster mom comes along and meets that need and a little pathway is formed. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So this, this little pathway is formed to the upstairs brain that says, if I am hungry, I might get fed. Then 30 seconds later, <laughs> when they're hungry again, <laughs> what do they do? Cry again. Cry again, because it's literally thousands, thousands of times that this process happens um, where I have a need, and I don't stop crying till the need is met. And there's a little bit of learning that happens again and again and again. And that lays down, hopefully, a rich, beautiful, super speed highway to the upstairs brain. So at three months, uh, baby starts fussing because they're hungry. They make eye contact with mama. And mama says, I know, I know, I'm doing it right now. And you bounce and you soothe and you use your voice and all this sensory rich experience right to solidify oh it's okay slow and curious slow and curious by six months you're across the room saying i'm getting your cheerios i know i see you're hungry i see it right and you're still using your mother ease you're using all your tools that have built that pathway to the upstairs brain so we're many thousands of repetitions in when you think about early life trauma, when you think about a brain that has been changed by alcohol or drugs in the womb, when you think about a kiddo who lost the only smells and sounds that they were used to right at birth um, because they're, they're suddenly in a different home with different smells and sounds, if you think about kids who've experienced neglect or abuse, who cried and that need wasn't met, or that need was met inconsistently, or instead of a safe big critter, they're met with a flipped lid, that, that changes how their brain is developing. And so instead of super speed highways to slow and curious, we get super speed highways to fast and furious. And it really looks like 
furious a lot of times, right? So in my workshops, you know, one of the things that I talk the, about the most is these big tiger moments because those are really hard to deal with because once upon a time, our kiddos had to be brave like a tiger. They had to defend themselves from scary, unsafe, uncertain situations. And so that's how their brains are wired. But the good news is we can change that. And so that's, the, that's my message of hope. That's, that's what I feel like um, part of what I, what I apply in my own parenting and my kids were born to me biologically, but all brains need wiring. You know, I don't know a single two-year-old who magically like knew how to share and accepted no and loved being told what to do, right? Like right. all brains need wired, all, all brains. And so what I found is this, this framework introduced in um, like disguised in <laughs> Riley the Brave is helpful across the board, but, but essential for yeah. kids who've had developmental trauma. So, I got a little sobering thinking about some of those pathways that weren't formed yeah. with my little lady. And so yeah. I know there's parents across the uh, parents listening, thinking this is starting to really sober me up about her narrow pathways in her history and some of the rewiring that we're doing that looks like behavior that should be for a three-year-old that's coming out at six. So right. we're just wiring those things now that never right. got wired. It right. makes so much sense. It makes so much sense.